Well, if you could turn in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verse 3, we think about testimonies like the one that we just heard, and I think about my testimony of the gospel of grace and how it is that I came to be a Christian, how it is that I came to be saved, since the Bible talks about it. And I know that I've shared this with you before, and so may, maybe this is familiar for some of you, but not for every one of you. I, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I didn't grow up explicitly you know, being discipled in, in the things of Christianity or the Bible. I never really even legitimately cracked open a Bible until I was 18 years old. I thought I knew a lot about what the Bible said, though I hadn't ever read it. I thought I knew a lot about why the Bible was untrustworthy, even though I never studied it. I found myself in a spot going into college where I was essentially very much like Stephen described. I was, well, from a different perspective, I was, I was sort of an atheist agnostic. I know it doesn't really make sense. I was just confused. I couldn't figure out which category to put myself in. I didn't know if there really was a God, but if there was, I didn't believe in him, and so at least I knew that much. And so I went to college, and I was confronted with the gracious word of God, I had some friends who invited me to church, really didn't have any interest in going, but there was really nothing better to do, and so I just went. I just went with them. And then they started a Bible study, and that Bible study was held in my dorm room, and so that was convenient for me. I left, would go to dinner. Nice guys, really wanted nothing to do with their God, but over time, they kind of wore me down, and they were, you know, they were nice, and so I eventually started to stay. I mean, I guess boredom is a means to the gospel. I think if, you can, if you're bored, it's not a bad thing. It can drive you into Christ because I was just didn't have anything better to do and it was in my room, so I stayed. And so I would hear the news of the gospel and God was working on me. And to keep the long story really short, I found myself, I think this was about the day before I actually think I was converted, the day before I became a Christian. There was lots of mini conversions along the way where I was warm towards God and I was inclined towards God and I would pursue him, but I, I wasn't yet someone who cast my whole life dependent upon him. But it was, I think it was like the day before that day, and I found myself at this conference of Christian college students, and there was about a thousand people there, and they were singing songs to God, and I was enjoying the environment and enjoying the singing, and we were singing a song, and all of a sudden, in a flash, I became an atheist again, standing there in the middle of this crowd, and I thought to myself, what am I doing here? You look around. How, how did I get here? How did I get to this spot where I'm surrounded by the people that I would never have wanted to be around, would never have agreed with, would never wanted to socialize with, let alone sing songs to an invisible God in this large conference room in Denver, Colorado? How did I get here? It was this atheistic moment. And it kind of shook me a little bit. How do I know that it's real? How do I know God is real? And I began to review the events of the last year and how I actually did come to this place. And I reminded myself of the things I had studied and the things I had read and the things that I had learned. And impossible as it seemed at that moment, how someone like me who had spent his whole high school, all four years of high school, actively pursuing things away from God, how a person who almost, in terms of an identity, would have said, my identity is not a Christian, how that person could be found to be among the Christians. And as I thought about the scriptures that I had read, and I thought about what God had taught me, and I thought about where I was in my life, I had one very simple answer for how it was that I got to be on that spot in that time. And the answer was, and still is, sovereign grace. God's sovereign grace, the gospel of grace that changed Stephen and has changed some and many of you, was working on me and was transforming the way that I thought about myself and the way that I thought about God and had brought me to this place where I was surrounded by Christians who were singing to this invisible God. When I read through the Bible more thoroughly, I found that that's how everyone comes to God. How does a sinner get turned into a God-praiser? 
sovereign grace. How does a guilty one avoid judgment but find forgiveness? Sovereign grace. Our passage this morning explains in such compact, clear, rich, beautiful, convicting, challenging language about how a Christian becomes a Christian. And even more than that, why a Christian has become a Christian. What God is attempting to do in a Christian. For what purposes is his sovereign grace working? And by what means is he using? We find ourselves in this wonderful section of this amazing book. This section, we're going to be in verses 3 through 6 this morning, but this passage proper is actually verses 3 through 14. Believe it or not, in the Greek, this is one long sentence. So from a grammatical standpoint, parents, you're not wanting to teach your kids how to write like this because it's kind of a run-on sentence, but it is a very good, divinely inspired, run-on sentence to the praise of God. This section, 3 through 14, is so massive in what it teaches theologically and so beautiful in what it unfolds that we're not going to preach it all in one sermon. We're actually going to preach it in three sermons and break it up into smaller bite-sized pieces. So we're fasting still as a church for many different things. There are things you are laying aside so that you might hunger deeper for God. Friends, this is a feast. This is a theological seven-course meal laid before us, and we are going to begin to eat. So, get your forks and knives ready and your napkins ready because we're going to dive in. Please follow along as I read. I'm going to read verses 3 through 14, but our verses today are 3 through 6. The Apostle Paul writes this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Even as he chose us in him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him, we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. We can just go home, but we're not going to. We're going to pray. Father, thank you for letting us have these words, these divinely inspired words that pull back the curtain and teach us what experience may show us or may not show us. But what defines what is real is you and your truth. And so we come to this passage hungry, thirsty. I pray for anyone here who's not hungry or thirsty for your truth this morning, just like I wasn't, just like Stephen wasn't. I pray, God, that you would open up our the hearts and minds of those who are here, that they might gain a taste for the glory that you are. Father, I pray you would do your work among us this morning through Christ. Amen. 
I don't know if when you read this passage, you, you think of this, but as I studied this passage, the overwhelming thing that came at me when I started studying was that the Apostle Paul is really fired up. I know it's just words on a page, but you start to read and unpack what he's saying, and, and he's pumped. If you read other letters from the Apostle Paul, he normally does his greeting, which we read last week, verses 1 and 2, and then he moves into a, a, a time of thanksgiving for the church and a commending of the church for their faith and giving praise to God for the church. He doesn't get there in this book until verse 15. It's like Paul's normal pattern is to greet and then to encourage, but in between verses 1 and 2 and verse 15, he just, he just breaks out in this long, amazing sentence because he cannot control himself because this thought that is on his mind is dominating him. He's so excited about God that he just interjects this long sentence with these words. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. This is an outburst of praise, very much in the Jewish style of blessing, like we heard when Joel read from Psalm 72, where it's blessing the Lord and then explaining for what purpose we are blessing the Lord. This is what he's doing. Bless the Lord who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Paul however, is thoroughly Christian with his blessing. And so he makes sure that we understand from the beginning which God he is blessing. It is the God and Father of the Lord, Jesus Christ. That is the God he worships. That is the God he's blessing. That is the God he is excited about. He is the blessed God. This phrase, blessed be, really is just the word bless in the original language. It could be translated, blessed God. And Father, blessed God who has blessed us. He's not, he's not hoping that God is someday blessed. He's not wishing for God to be blessed. He is declaring, God, you are the blessed one who blesses us. It is this outburst of praise. And you might be thinking to yourself, Paul, chill out, dude. The letter just started. You're getting the pastor all worked up. He's got to ramp up. Maybe, maybe take, take some less Red Bull or, you know, calm down on the five-hour energy drinks. Paul cannot because he has been given a gift that has overwhelmed his soul. He has been given a gift that he cannot stop thinking about. We get excited, right, when people give us gifts that are helpful, that make our lives easier, if you don't have a car, you don't have transportation, and you find yourself walking everywhere or taking the bus, and you do this for months or maybe even years, and then someone comes along and gives you a Lexus IS 350 sport car, you'd be pretty pumped. You'd be pretty excited about that gift. Well, the gift that Paul is reflecting on and the gift that Paul is considering, the gift that Paul is excited about makes the sports car look like a Tonka toy. In comparison, why is Paul so excited as he begins this letter? Because he has been meditating on the gift of God's awesome salvation. He has been thinking about what it means to have become a Christian, what God had to do in order for, he, for him to become a Christian, how it's even possible that a sinner who has offended a holy God could ever stand in right relationship with him. He is meditating on it. He is, it's like drinking theological Mountain Dew. He is guzzling it by the gallons. The glory of the, of the gospel of his salvation is coursing through his veins, and he is pumped. He is fired up. Because there is no mistaking his conclusion that because the blessed God has moved in his life, he is blessed. And not just Paul, but every believer who comes to God through faith in Christ, turning away from their sins, who has received this salvation, is also blessed. He writes, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, plural, in Christ. 
So this letter is not just about Paul being excited. This letter is meant to make us excited too about the salvation that we've received. In other words, because of our faith in Christ and given to us through our faith in Christ, we have been blessed with a precious gift that if we take the time to stop and think about and understand and meditate on, it is a gift so stunning that it becomes the very basis and occasion for which we praise God. You don't need more money to praise God. You don't need the Lexus sports car to praise God. You don't need a change of job or a change of scenery to praise God. If you are in Christ, you have every motivation of praise, every occasion to praise him, you have. So what have we been blessed with? He says, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. That's how Paul starts. Paul's vision of this blessing is on a cosmic level. No cosmic killjoy. He's blessed us in the heavenly places. In fact, this expression, heavenly places, is used exclusively in Ephesians. And it refers to the the place where God dwells, Christ dwells where the principalities and powers dwells, this spiritual realm that coexists with what we see in our eyes. He writes this in Ephesians 1, 3, verse 20, 2, verse 6. And then you know in Ephesians 6, he talks about this at length. Paul cannot guarantee that you won't have trouble in this life. But on the eternal, cosmic level, you have been blessed with every spiritual blessing. Everything that God has to bless you with is yours. Every source of power you need is yours. All the reward for a life lived by faith in God is yours. You own it. You lack nothing if you're a Christian. It's not like there are some Christians whose pantries are bare and they're jealous of the other Christians whose pantries are full. No, if you are in Christ, whether you are a baby in Christ, whether you've been a Christian for 40 years, God's power through the Spirit and his blessings overflow to us and every one of us is filled to the max with this promise. Now, this promise is in this heavenly realm, which means that these promises are real, but we don't have all of them in our hands yet. The things I think that we want God to do oftentimes are the things that we can see and the things that we can touch. What this passage is reminding us is that we have promises that are real, but they can't be seen. They're in the realm of the heavenly. It's like getting the title to a piece of property, but not yet actually stepping foot onto the location. It's yours. You own it. Cannot be taken away from you. And we're marching our way forward to this blessing. Well, Paul goes on to describe what kind of blessing this is, what it really looks like. He unpacks this. Yes, they are reserved in the heavenly places, but they are here in this letter to help assure us of what is to come. And so he begins to describe what this means. And one of the blessings that comes forward first is that God chose us for salvation. Look in verse 4. We've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. The Bible speaks of this as election. God chooses to set his steadfast, everlasting covenant love upon sinners. The Bible calls this election. God saves sinners through the gospel of grace. And if you've been with us at Grace Church, you've read through some of the stories of the Old Testament that we've, that we've been in, you'll see that election isn't mentioned in Ephesians for the first time. It's actually a theme that makes its way throughout the whole Bible. It marks the very story of the Old Testament. You think about Abraham, Abram being turned into Abraham. What happens? God chooses a sinner, and sets him apart for his purposes, to make him the father of of a great nation, to give him offspring, to be a blessing to the nations. J. 
Genesis 12. Continue to read in Genesis and you see the story of Jacob and Esau. Where in Genesis 25, the word says, the older shall serve the younger. That was in the contrast to the tradition and Esau and Jacob had their, reverse, their roles reversed. God had chosen before they had done anything, whether good or bad, to make the younger, the older serve the younger. And then we saw a couple of years ago when we did the story of Joseph. God chooses the youngest, the unlikely, raises him up. And then God raises up Pharaoh. And then God raises up Moses. And it's a story of election. In fact, even the whole nation of Israel was said to be chosen by God. In election, Deuteronomy 7, verse 6, the Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasure possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. God chooses to love sinners. That's remarkable when you think about it. God chooses to love God-haters. He elects to love sinners. This is not like the election that we just had where people go to the polls and they cast their vote and choose who's going to be a president. There is no popular vote that gets taken. No, this election is all a work of God, even as he chose us. It is all based on God's choice, and it is good, and it is great, and it is glorious because it is sovereign grace that is overflowing to sinners like us so that we might be saved. This is what Paul is excited about. I know that some don't agree with this doctrine. Some would disagree that God chooses sinners. Some would want to argue that sinners choose God, not the other way around. There's a sense in which, because of the prior working of God on our lives, there is a place where, given faith from God, we do respond as humans towards God. But when we read the scriptures, especially Ephesians 1, we see a picture behind the scenes of what God has done. It's what enables us and allows us to even get to the place where we can respond to God. Some would teach that the the, the gospel of salvation is presented as a gift that God holds out in his hand. And all he requires of you and from me is to just simply reach out and take that gift. The problem with that picture and that theology is is that it doesn't account for the way that the Bible talks about the nature of man. You remember the scene maybe from the classic movie Princess Bride where Wesley gets brought to Miracle Max by Inigo Montoya and he wants him to heal him and remember what Miracle Max tells him? He says, you're in luck. It just so happens that your friend here is only mostly dead. There's a big difference between being mostly dead and all dead. Mostly dead is slightly alive. With all dead, well, with all dead, there's only usually one thing you can do. What's that, Inigo says? Go through his clothes and look for loose change. You're either dead or mostly dead, which is slightly alive. Paul goes on in chapter 2, verse 1, to say, look, at, look in your Bibles, chapter 2, verse 1, and you were dead. The Greek translates into dead. There, there's, there's no mostly dead in this passage. Dead. Spiritually dead. Amen. Dead people don't move their arm to take the gifts. Others would teach and concede that God does choose, but the basis for which he chooses is by looking down the corridor of time and seeing those that would love him and therefore on the basis of their love and their faith for God choose to elect to salvation. That would be like saying in January of 96 when I was in that conference and the, the day after I had that experience when I broke down on my knees and I prayed and I said, God, my life is yours. I surrender myself to you to do with my life whatever you will. That that would be interpreted as the basis for which God then saves me. 
because God, you know, I knew he would come through. Yeah, he was having some atheistic moment the day before, but I knew he would come through and I knew he would show that he does indeed love me. And that's why I picked him. I think we can see that that view has problems. A dead person can't choose to make themselves alive. That is a work of miraculous magnitude that only a sovereign God who has sovereign grace can do. You ha- if you believe, verse 1 of chapter 2, that you are dead in your trespasses and sins, then you have to have an answer for how a dead person comes alive. And I don't have a good answer for you except for what the Bible says. The dead come to life through sovereign grace. That's how it works. There's no passage in the Bible that speaks about God looking down the corridors of time to see who would choose him on their own as the grounds for electing grace. It's just not there. It's, it's, a, it's a nice picture, but it's not, it's not in the Bible. Rather, the Bible teaches the opposite. God determined to redeem his elect. And the Bible says, look, look back in verse 4. When did he do this? Before the foundation of the world. The teaching of the Bible is before the foundation of the world. Before any one of us could do anything good or bad, God, by his free nature and his purposes, not dependent upon us or responding to us, but rooted in his gracious nature, predestined us for salvation. You could read in verse 5, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace. There is no mention there, church, of your works, good or bad. It is according to him. This is repeated in John chapter 1, verses 11 through 13, where John writes, he, Jesus, came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, listen to this, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. God is the God who saves. It is through sovereign grace that God saves. It is not like a gift that sits in the palm of your hand that must be grasped. That is not the right picture. It is like a life preserver that is around a floating corpse in the ocean. And as the gospel is preached, miraculous sovereign grace brings the dead body to life. And it instinctively, by faith, grabs to that which saves, which is the preserver around them, which is the gospel. If God doesn't bring alive that person, there is no salvation. That is the nature of sovereign grace. It is through grace that the dead are made alive. It is through grace that the lost are found. It is through grace that the guilty are set free. And all of these things are in this chapter. And all of this begins with the election of God before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. Now, I know I talk fast. I'm working on it. I eat fast, too. I, I, I eat a meal with Dale, and I'm basically done before like, he's even picked his fork up. Dale and I move at two different paces. And I, I've often told him, I, I need to be more like you. I need to go slow. I need to eat slow. I need to think slower. I need to move a little bit slower. Dale's meticulous and thoughtful about what he does. And I, I think in this passage, it's easy for us to just hear these things and to just move quickly past them. But brothers and sisters, if if this is true, if this is true, which it is, oh my goodness, how are we here? How are you here sitting today? Not judged, not condemned, not sitting in hell. Sovereign grace that you earned no part of. You played no part in counseling God to save you. He decided to do it. I remember my 10-year, I've shared this story too, but my my 10-year high school reunion, I got an email from a friend of mine who was asking if I was going to go to this reunion and was 
describing his life, and his life looked exactly the way my life looked before I became a Christian. And I received the email at the pastor's college while I was being trained for ministry. And it was like looking in a mirror 10 years earlier. This is who I am. This is who I was. I don't pursue these things anymore, not because of anything in me, but because God did a sovereign work of grace in my life to transform me. And as I read that email, I wept and I cried. That God would want to have mercy on me. He wants me to be holy and blameless and he's going to do what it takes to make me holy and blameless in his sight. The words for holy and blameless this describes, you know, in the sacrificial system of the Old Testament, it describes the unblemished animals that were offered for sacrifice. Yeah. It began throughout time to sort of take on this ethical or moral sense of purity, to be holy and blameless. It's the goal by which God is moving us forward to on that final day because of the blood of the unblemished, spotless lamb that was shed for us that we would be completed on the final day as Todd shared earlier. That's the trajectory of where we're going. God is preparing his people who were sinners and who are guilty. He is preparing his people to stand before his holy throne. The only way you will stand before that holy throne without fear and without trembling and without judgment awaiting you is by standing under the mercy of God through his sovereign grace. Your life may not feel like it's holy. Your life may not feel like it's blameless. But ponder this. That's exactly who you are in Christ. When Paul says that you have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, this is yours as well. In the muck of your guilt and of your sins, you are holy in God's sight. With the filth of impurity that runs through your mind, you are pure in God's sight. With the weight of the offenses you have against God that are daily, you are counted blameless in God's sight. Every spiritual blessing, Christian, is yours. Blessed be God should be our response through the one who was holy and blameless, through the one who was cursed with every curse. Jesus was cursed with every curse. Cursed is he who hangs on the tree so that we could be blessed with every blessing. That's sovereign grace in Christ. Charles Spurgeon once wrote, Grace has been displayed of old in the great council chamber where all the attributes of God sat in solemn conclave to devise a way by which God should be glorified. Foreknowledge, as one of the attributes of God, prophesied that man, if made fallible, would sadly fall. Justice, therefore, arose and thundered forth his word that if man fell and transgressed the Creator's command, he must be punished. Grace, however, asks whether it could not be possible that man could be saved and yet justice should be satisfied. Wisdom, infinite wisdom, answered the question, and God's own Son was the answer. He promised that in the fullness of time he would become a man for us and for our redemption bear the whole weight of Jehovah's justly merited wrath that the vessels of mercy might be secured. Now, albeit that all the other attributes displayed themselves in the council chamber when our soul in holy reverence dares venture into that one secret but now revealed council of the Most High, we are com compelled to admire all the attributes of God, but most of all, His grace. Why, it seems to me that grace presided at this Congress. It was grace that pressed man's suit. It was grace that inspired wisdom. It was grace that invited wisdom to be its counselor. It was grace that defended man when justice might have spoken against him. Grace was our advocate. Christ Jesus, who was grace itself of old, as he is now, stood then as the wonderful 
the counselor. And he devised the plan, pleaded our cause, and promised to work it out. I know this passage goes down as one of those tough texts. If you Google tough texts, Ephesians 1, 3 through 6 comes up. I know it's hard for us in our, in our finite minds to get our minds around the vast mystery that is the doctrine of grace and the doctrine of election. But I want to encourage you this morning that in believing this doctrine, in believing this doctrine, it is something to be praised. It is not meant to be a contentious doctrine of debate. It is truth that comes to us in the context of praise. You don't see Paul talking about election here and and, and stirring the church up to debate whether it's true or not. It is in the context of praise. Election is meant to produce awe in our souls as we contemplate how did we get here. And we can't come up with any other answer but God's sovereign grace. It's meant to make our hearts exclaim, Blessed God! If you gut election from the awe so that you can trade it as a debating chip, you have lost the very purpose of election, which is to the praise of his glorious grace. It is not meant to be a doctrine of debate. Yes, we need to wrestle with the truth of the word, but the believers that God has that don't believe this truth are saved by this truth equally whether they know it, agree with it, or not. It's also not meant to paralyze your faith. Some talk about election. They think, well, if God's elected people, then why do I need to share the gospel? Because God knows who he's going to save. Well, you misunderstand election if you believe that. Election has always been for the good of the nations. From Abraham on, God chose Abraham, what? To be a blessing to all the nations. This gospel is to go forward into all the nations. It is not meant to shrink you in your evangelism. It is meant to empower you in your evangelism because God is the God who saves. So we're not supposed to spend, we're not encouraged anywhere in Scripture to spend time trying to discern, is my friend elect? Any more than someone who has a more Arminian theology is should be paralyzed by asking, will my friend eventually believe through all the times I share the gospel with him? No. Neither. It's meant to drive us into action of prayer and of truth-telling and of love. That as you share the gospel of grace, you can have confidence that God can save and does save. And you stand as the evidence of this truth that he has saved you. We have been blessed. There's still dessert to get to. We're still working on the main dish here. Forgiveness of sins is only one part of the divine gifts. It's not the only part. In fact, the rest of this section goes on to tease out what God is doing through this election and through this salvation. And we see the beginnings of this in verses 5 through 6 that he chose us for adoption. In love, verse 5, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Now, Stephen said something interesting during his, his testimony time up front. He said, you're either believing the lie of the devil or you're believing the truth of the king. Well, that's exactly the way Jesus describes it too in the Gospel of John, that Jesus, as he talks, And John records it in chapter 8 and in chapter 14. He describes us as spiritual orphans under the sway of our birth father, Satan. And then Paul picks up Jesus' language and Jesus' theology in Ephesians 2 when he says that we were all, look in chapter 2, verse 2, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Believing the lies of the one who claimed to be our father, who is Satan. 
But God has a rescue plan that salvation brings forth. Christ comes to our earthly orphanage on this earth into our pain, into our suffering, into our rebellion, into our isolation. He comes like light piercing into the darkness, not to judge us, not to bring God's wrath upon us, but to forgive us, to lavish forgiveness, not just forgiveness and not just acquittal for our crimes and not just to make us good and better people, not even to lavish good gifts upon us. He comes to give us the very gift of God himself as Father, to give us Dad, to sever the bonds that Satan holds over us, to give us full rights as sons and daughters, to give us the inheritance that that a son would have, to make us brothers with Jesus, to withhold no good gift from us. I know it's every adoptive parent's worst nightmare to think about the process of adoption and the way that our legal system works and the inability to secure confidently in the beginning that this adoption is going to work and that it's going to come to pass. Even until the very last day, even in times when the baby is in the arms of the new family, it can still be reversed. It can still be overturned. It can still be lost. Not so with Christ. The beloved eternal son has come to ratify this adoption ceremony. He's come to ratify it with his own blood on the cross. As we read throughout Matthew and Luke, Mark and the Gospels, this scene as Jesus hangs on this cross and in some mysterious way is rejected by God separated from the intimacy with the Father that he knew as the Son, as God pours out his wrath upon Jesus, which was the wrath for sinners. And Jesus in that moment becomes a substitute orphan for us. He takes our place. And he cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the Father turns his face away from him and judges him for our sins. And Jesus is temporarily cut off from this loving relationship with the Father that he has known for all eternity. It's it's lost for this moment. Why? So that you and you and you and me and all that God's called into his fold might draw near. And then Jesus says, like a judge's gavel coming down, striking, it is is finished. Salvation has been secured. It cannot be lost. It is legally and permanently God's forever. This is what it brings us into God's family through faith. Not just saved from our sins, but made as sons, as daughters. This assures us that God loves us. It gives us hope when it doesn't feel like God loves us. What do you do when you feel like God's forsaken you or God has turned his back on you? What do you do? You go back to Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 6, and you remind yourself that this is irrevocable, that God has chosen to bind his love to you as a son or as a daughter. J.I. Packer said, God receives us as sons and loves us with the same steadfast affection with which he eternally loves his beloved only begotten. That is breathtaking. There are no distinctions of affection in the divine family. We are all loved just as fully as Jesus is loved. It is like a fairy story. The reigning monarch adopts waifs and strays to make princes of them. But praise God, it is not a fairy story. It is hard and solid facts founded on the bedrock of free and sovereign grace. This and nothing less than this is what adoption means. No wonder what John cries. Behold, what manner of love. When once you understand adoption, your heart will cry the same. You are not alone. It does not matter how lonely you feel. You are not alone. So as we close, how does this help us? 
This is a doctrine to praise. How does this help us on a Tuesday morning when you're getting out of bed? How should this unbelievable doctrine help you live out your life? Well, let me submit to you that this is the mirror by which you must gaze into every morning when you get out of bed. This is the mirror by which you must reflect into every day as you get out of bed. This mirror is casting forth your new, unshakable identity as God's chosen people. So when you get out of bed and you feel like a monster, you go to the mirror and you remind yourself of a God whose saving grace has overwhelmed you with mercy, who has chosen you, who has brought you near, who has lavished his adopting love upon you, and whom will never forsake you. That's the picture you must gaze into every day to set your heart right. Because you have the continual full favor of God resting on you every moment of your life. For the Christian, there is no bad day in Christ. Because every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places is guaranteed yours, whether the day here on earth feels like it or not. So that's how it helps you. It reminds you that you have an, a heavenly family that maybe your earthly family failed at. You have a new father. You have new brothers and sisters in the Lord. Jesus himself is your brother. You are now a son. You are now a daughter. You are not alone. Every day is a battle to remember this foundational truth. I don't know what your struggle is, but every day you must battle with remembering the power of this truth. When your body is aching with cancer, you must remember that you are blessed in Christ. When you See your kids disregarding your words again. You remember that you are blessed in Christ. When the job doesn't pan out the way you want, you are blessed in Christ. When you break God's word and you feel guilty and you wonder if God will ever love you again, you must remember that because of Christ, you are blessed and not forsaken. God is still welcoming orphans into his house this morning. And so as I close, I want to appeal to those of you who are here that if you're not a Christian, I want to invite you to believe upon this great gospel of grace that can transform an agnostic atheist sinner like myself and can put something in my heart that I never had, which was a desire for God. And he will transform you. He is committed to it by the blood of his son. He blesses us that we might be a blessing to him and to the nations, all to the praise of his glorious grace. So as we take communion this morning, may our song be to the praise of his glory, to the praise of his mercy and grace. Let's pray together. Father, what a great section of your word. And I know, Lord, that my words are insufficient to communicate the glory that's here. Lord, would you open up our eyes to see why this is important? Would you cause us, Lord, to to stand in awe of you again? Lord, revive our souls with what you've done for the sake of your glory. In Christ's name, amen.